First of all, let me say this. Uh, Ron Lee Moore was born in Bellhaven, North Carolina, and was raised in Bath, North Carolina. He attended the University of North Carolina, graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Upon, upon graduation from UNC, he attended and graduated from the UNC Law School in Chapel Hill. After graduation, he began his practice of law at the firm of Gray, Kimmel, and Connolly, later to become Westall Gray and Connolly PA, and worked at that firm until his election as the Buncombe County District Attorney in 1990. He served in that capacity since that day. He has coached youth baseball and youth football and mentored underprivileged kids here in the community. He's married to Mary Elizabeth Arrowwood, an attorney here in town. They have a 15-year-old daughter, Susan Alexander Moore. Ron and his family is a member of the Central United Methodist Church. Todd Williams is a North Carolina native, born in Winston-Salem, graduated high school in Alamance County. He attended UNC Chapel Hill, where he graduated in 1992, and then the Northwestern University School of Law in 1999. Most recently, Todd held employment with the statewide office of the North Carolina Capital Defender, and was one of 12 assistant capital defenders providing representation in capital eligible prosecutions in the state. In addition, he has served as an assistant public defender in Buncombe County and senior assistant public defender of the 29, 29B that Judicial District, practicing all criminal courts in North Carolina, including juvenile court and specialized courts such as the Drug Treatment Court. He has moved to Western North Carolina since 2000 and resides in Asheville with his wife, Catherine, and his young daughter. And gentlemen, I'm going to begin the process of question. I'll start uh, with Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore, what are the greatest challenges that you foresee facing the office of the district attorney in the foreseeable future, and how do you plan to meet those challenges? Well, as always, resources. You know, first start is DA. We had six assistant DAs. I'm now blessed to have 15. We continue to have more and more cases. Buncombe County has gone from 160 to a quarter of a million people, 160,000 to a quarter of a million since I've been DA, as has the state the same percentage. So we continue to need more resources. We also have tried to do more things such as add DWI court. We're looking at adding the domestic violence component, Department of Social Services soon. We're constantly striving to offer more services with requiring more resources. Uh, I've been to Raleigh many times, trying to make the system better, trying to get more help. Just recently, we signed the agreement with Park Ridge Hospital to test blood and DWI, so we could try to catch up on our backlog. But the whole system, the North Carolina court system, is underfunded historically. It has been. It used to be three percent of the budget. Now it's down around two. So that's the biggest challenge: getting the resources that we need. I want to thank the commissioners for building the building next door. We now have a space. Now we need the personnel, the equipment. Uh, this forum needs wireless. We have electronic discovery. I've been fussing with ASC trying to get them to put wireless in here so that we can access the uh, uh, electronic discovery information sitting in the courtroom. We don't have the ability to do it that right now, and we don't have paper files anymore. So things like that, just getting the technology to be able to do our work, getting the personnel. We lost three people, uh, a person each year, a lot of legislators, a legal assistant, uh, plus the cutbacks. So we need our help uh, so we can provide services so that when you come to the DA's office, you have somebody you can talk to that's got a minute to talk to you so we can staff the courts adequately, deal with the public, and continue to deal with more and more work and change the laws that we have to deal with every day. Thank you. Mr. Williams, you want to respond? Uh, yes. Uh, I believe that the biggest challenge facing the district attorney's office in the future is to restore public trust and integrity in the prosecution's criminal justice system here in Buncombe County. This past week, for instance, uh, I received the endorsement of Dr. Olson Huff. Dr. Huff is a nationally renowned pediatrician in uh, the Dr. The Olson Huff Center, the Mission Children's Clinic, uh, down in Mission St. Joseph's, um, is where the investigations for child abuse and sex, sex uh, offenses occur. Dr. Huff stated to me that he felt that the turnaround in the prosecutions of child abuse cases is lagging and that it's time for a change. Dr. Huff's belief is that the district attorney's office is not prosecuting child abuse cases vigorously enough at this juncture. 
We need to restore the integrity of the district attorney's office. We'll do that by prosecuting these cases and other cases vigorously, reducing the turnaround uh, for victims, and, and also it's a fairness issue for defendants. I believe that's the biggest thing, the biggest issue facing the district attorney's office in the future. All right. Thanks, Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, I'll direct this question to you. What is your position regarding the speedy trial capital cases? Speedy trial capital cases. Capital cases are extremely complex. Capital cases involve uh, numerous experts. They're very expensive to bring to trial. Capital cases require a second counsel. They require a mitigation expert. They require very often psych psychiatric um, expertise in addition to other experts in forensic sciences. Those cases, obviously, the Supreme Court has said death, quote unquote, death is different. Those cases where the ultimate punishment is sought should not be rushed to trial, simply put. Uh, that's a fairness issue. Uh, and under my leadership, defendants will, should capital punishment be sought, defendants will have a fair opportunity to, to prepare for trial. Sure. Well, first, you've never tried a murder case, and you're not qualified to sit first chair as a defense lawyer because you've never tried one. So, I'll tell you how the capital cases work. In this county, we've tried many capital cases. I stood right here in front of this jury box and asked for death a number of times. The biggest problem in death cases right now is resources. We are getting backed up by the lab. It takes years to get DNA. Uh, nobody's rushing death penalty cases to trial. And uh, I'm curious, uh, Mr. Williams, when you get a chance, if you would actually seek death penalty in a case since you're on the record being morally opposed to it. But at any rate, uh, nobody's rushing anybody. Back when I first got an office, we actually tried death cases six, eight, ten months. Now it's usually two years if we're lucky because we're waiting on stuff from the lab. You can't get DNA, you can't get uh, rape kits back uh, because the lab's backed up. Again, we've got to continue to push uh, as a prosecutor to get the lab adequately funded by the legislature. Until we do that, uh, you'll have plenty of time to get ready. Uh, the question is, more importantly, if you're going to stand up here and try death penalty cases or murder cases, you've got to have adequate experience. Uh, the folks in my office are trying, we have a training regimen. You start out trying misdemeanor appeals, a little more serious, you sit in the chair, then you are lead counsel in death penalty cases. Uh, okay, Dreher and I have probably tried as many as anybody in the state over the last 20 years, and you know, we're the ones that are teaching the rest of them, Pat Patton also. Uh, but you've got to have some ability to know how to uh, nurture and foster young attorneys so that they have the skills and the knowledge and be available for them to uh, know what to do in a death penalty case. All right, Mr. Lohr. Should the district attorney's office provide discovery in district court cases as a general practice? Again, that would be absolutely a resource issue. But number one, we don't. Are you talking about federal cases or district? All district court. Cases. Well, all district court cases, no, because we don't have discovery. Police officers do not bring us anything. Most of you see in a district court case when we open the shelf with a citation or a warrant. That's about all we know about. So we don't have any discovery to you. It's a rare case where we have any discovery. The case there might be a mystery or child abuse or whatever. Uh, I'm reasonably satisfied that the lawyers go in and talk to the assistant DAs about what the case may be about. But we do literally hundreds of thousands of cases in district court every year, whether it's a speeding ticket, whether it's a driving on a license to vote. And the lawyers that practice in those courts know that they have the ability to come to our office and request a driver's license printout so they'll know what the status of their client's licenses are, why they're revoked, uh, or what their penalty may be if they're driving drunk, if it's their second or third offense within so many years. So again, it would be a resource issue for anything we did have something, uh, but for most of the district court cases, there are uh, no, there's no information provided by law enforcement other than what's in the files that show the public file. Mr. Williams, you can respond. Thank you. Well, this is a fairness issue. Discovery is commonly provided to folks who are prosecuted in Superior Court and District Court in felony matters. However, quite frequently, misdemeanor prosecutions are extremely important um, 
to the defendants that are brought for prosecution in, in Buckingham County Court. Uh, I have been in contact with an individual who, who was prosecuted, um, and I believe he was prosecuted to jury trial here on misdemeanor child abuse uh, in this courtroom. Uh, and he ultimately lost his, his job as an assistant principal here in Buckingham County. Uh, discovery in misdemeanor cases is essential to ensure fairness and allow defendants, number one, an opportunity to prepare a defense in district court rather than um, be tried by, by ambush wherever possible, and, and number two, perhaps reach settlement and conserve judicial resources. So I, under my leadership, where possible, we will institute a misdemeanor discovery program. Mr. Williams, how do you believe your approach to running the office of the district attorney if you were elected would differ from that of the opponent? First of all, I want to create a, a supportive team environment among the assistants in the office. I, I want my assistants to feel that they have discretion to do what they need to do on, on, as they work their doctor <coughs> in court. And in addition to that, I will continue the policies that work in the district attorney's office. I want to say right now that, that this district attorney has done a good job in starting adult drug treatment court and DWI treatment court. In addition to that, I would like to broaden out and and create some additional specialized courts should the, the, the bar and our, our judges and, and other participants in the system be willing to do so. I believe that a, a veterans treatment court is essential to, uh, to, per, to provide for the needs, needs of veterans who, uh, who have suffered traumatic brain injury, PTSD, have other specialized needs in regard to their, their, uh, their, their personal biographies. Having been to serve overseas, suffered injuries related to combat, I've talked to uh, police, police officers who've stated that they're seeing petty crime, homelessness, and other issues uh, that can be alleviated. I hope we can bring some mental health professionals in to our system and, uh, and, and increase our public safety through expansion of our specialized treatment courts. We have nuisance court. We have domestic violence court. We put all those cases in the same court every Wednesday. We did that years and years ago. Al Williams was talking earlier this last week or so, some folks about veterans court. There's finally apparently money available from the feds to start such a court. Every court we start requires money. All of you know that we have special days for different courts. Frequently we have to hire a judge to come in either hold that court or replace the regular judge. For example, Calvin Hill does nuisance court. We wanted a local judge who was vested in downtown as opposed to some random visiting judge. So we hire a judge to take Calvin Hill's place in the rotation every time we have nuisance court. And we're getting ready to start a special domestic violence court, if you will. Uh, it's rolling out probably in the middle of May, something that Becky Knight's been working on for over a year, uh, looking at the research about how we should do that. And what we're going to do is wind up having violent assessments of people and decide who should be in this court and if they make bond and they'll be wearing GPS monitors. Uh, all the specialized courts are great, but it takes clerks. Every time we do an extra court, Steve Cogger has to find a clerk. He's perpetually shorthanded because of what the legislature's done. I have to have a DA, a public defender has to have somebody who's got the time to go to a special court because every day we run somewhere between three and six courts in this system here. Every day there are three. Uh, district criminal courts. Every Wednesday there's a fourth one. Sometimes we're running two superior courts. It's all about resources. Mr. Moore, regarding the issue of the calendaring of superior court criminal cases by the district attorney's office, do you have any opinion as to whether that system should continue as it is or should change in any manner? Well, I believe the DA should still control the calendar. Here's the issue. Of course, here in this county now, most of our calendars have five to ten cases. In the old days, there were places where you had hundreds of cases on the Superior Court calendar every Monday, uh, just because that was the nature of the beast. A few years ago, uh, we developed a plan all across the state, uh, 
Judge Winter and I, with influence from Hustad or other people, we developed a calendar plan. We had an administrative board where uh, we talk about cases, we make plea offers, we hope you communicate with your clients, we set plea dates. Eventually, we get a trial calendar. Most of our trial have a trial calendar for five to ten days. Uh, there's nobody sitting out on the other side of the bar that wants to run in here and have a trial. Most of you will continue the case every time you get a chance because your client's not ready for a trial because bad things may happen if they're convicted. The best thing will be that they get probation, have to pay money, have to work, have to uh, have bed checks, uh, so on and so forth. So not too many people are knocking down the door. The only person in the whole system who wants to push cases to trial is the district attorney because we have thousands of cases coming in every year. We have 46 or 47 weeks of court in this room. We have two, 3,000 cases a year. Uh, so we're the ones that want to push. And if you, if you turn it over to a judge, you're fine. A visiting judge from another county does not care whether my document gets down to manageable size or whether it doubles or triples over the course of a couple years. We're the ones, we will run on the docket. Uh, we have to manage it. Now, the one thing that uh, I've heard Romans is that you want a trial order every Monday morning. Well, years ago, we started doing that. Some lawyers didn't want a trial order because we give you, uh, we tell you, we talk to you the week before which one's first, second, third for trial. Now, sometimes things break down, but we're, if, if the bar wants that, I'm happy to do that. But be advised, we'll have to stick to it. As the EA, I see this as a, an issue of fairness that could easily be corrected by bringing uh, Baltimore County Administration of Justice in compliance with Chapter 7A. Throughout Western North Carolina, in, in, the, in the districts that I've practiced in, every district attorney office publishes a trial order. And for some reason, in this county, that's never been done. Um, again, I think it's an issue of fundamental fairness to provide uh, the defendant, defense counsel, an opportunity to under, know and understand when, when witnesses need to be present. This could all. This is also for the convenience of victims. I would contend, so that they can understand. You know, perhaps <coughs> the court Monday. It's just a simple organizational tool that should be utilized, and it's also the law. The law is to guarantee fairness. I will bring the district attorney's office within the ambit of Chapter 7A of the General Statutes and comply with that law that requires the district attorney to publish a trial order. Mr. Williams, do you have any uh, particular thoughts about the concept of imposing term limits in the office of the district attorney? I, uh, after 24 years from now, I'll be 68. Um, I will not seek re-election at the end of the season. Uh, so, uh, no, I don't have specific thoughts about term limits for the office of the district attorney. I think the public is the term limit every four years when they decide whether or not you're doing a good job. Just one more follow-up. The actual law says any lawyer can demand or ask for a trial order in the calendar call in the administrative matters. And in the past, we had some lawyers that did that and they didn't like the product they got because we gave them a trial order. If you want to show up Monday morning and ask for a trial uh, order, we would like to give it to you. Because we have told the lawyers what we're going to try. We're the ones that get the victims here. So we're in communication with them constantly. I have at least two people right behind that door with whose full time job is dealing with victims and witnesses cases that we try to support. Mr. Williams, if you want to respond, you have that right. Yes, sir. Mr. Moore, yes, sir. what is the duty of a district attorney when it comes to allegations of public corruption within his, within his or her prosecutorial district, such as in the case of Sheriff Bobby Medford here in Buckham County, or the reported theft from and tampering with evidence in the actual police department evidence First, I'm going to read something real quick, Judge. A bunch of folks have been sued for $300 million. The city, the county, Judge Hill, Judge Capital, Judge Young, Drew Reisinger. Uh, it says that he provided, uh, let people change documents and so on and so forth. And on one occasion, he said anybody could change files. Drew, I don't believe you said that. 
when somebody has sued you for $300 million, they sued me yesterday also, I don't know what happened. But, uh, but anyway, people have alleged anything they want, as we know, in the media or in the uh, in a printed motion. Now, a few years ago, there was something printed that was part of the cartel. And I was burdened when I got the phone call about that. I was stunned because I didn't know what the person was talking about. Telling me what was talking about. But anyway, a lot of things I cannot respond to. A lot of things for 24 years I've taken my lumps. I will continue to do that. If you're the district attorney or any other elected official, you will have to do it too. Because there are a lot of things I can't talk about. I have a lot in my head. I wish I could give you some of it. I'd love to, uh, but I'm not allowed. I did bring, here's one of the 15 volumes of the audit. I've read every page of it. I'm not sure why you haven't come read it because I've made it available to the defense counsel. The only one who's read it, as far as I know, is Leanne Melton. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff in there to the judge. I'm happy to release it, but I can't until the case is over. I see the defense lawyer here. He'd set his hair on fire if it was in the paper tomorrow, waiting for his client to be sentenced, or if his client decides to draw his plea and wants a jury trial. You know, that's not the way we can conduct ourselves. You know, there are rumors and any windows at any given time. I put a lot of drug dealers in jail. I've had a lot of relatives and mothers walk out of here cussing me uh, at the, on the back of the uh, places where you're sitting. All kinds of things will get written about what's going on in here. So, you know, it just goes with the territory, okay? I hunt, fish, take my daughter to ballet, and work. As the EA, I'll do the best that I can to avoid allegations of public corruption, number one. Number two, uh, in regard to the evidence locker, let's take that example. Um, the district attorney is obligated to communicate effectively with the community. Um, in regard to the evidence locker, there, I contend there is a public perception that the documents just simply have not been released um, for an unknown reason. Uh, since I filed, uh, I've heard that my candidacy, since I filed for this, for this district attorney position, I've heard that the document could not be released due to, uh, I guess, the due process rights of the federal defendant uh, who was the custodian of the, of, of the uh, locker room. That, I don't believe, was communicated effectively with the community and has cast a pall over the integrity of the district attorney's office. Under my leadership, I will strive to communicate effectively with the community when there is an issue regarding an evidence locker room. I will be at the forefront of communicating with the community to ensure the integrity of our systems. Mr. Williams, where there are allegations of um, prosecutorial misconduct directed toward a district attorney's office, for example, failing to disclose exculpatory evidence or failing to prevent witness intimidation by law enforcement. What response to those allegations is most productive? I will admit the mistake and move forward as your district attorney. That is an openness, a transparency uh, issue. This is what I'll bring. I'll bring a new perspective to the office. The integrity of our system requires a swift response to problems that if there, if there were prosecutorial misconduct, and I will strive to ensure that there is no prosecutorial mis misconduct, of course, I will, as district attorney, take rapid action to address that. And if that means bringing convicted defendants back to court for a new trial, or a new hearing, or resentencing, I will do that. That will be a victory for our community. There's no, there's no point in uh, in fighting uh, about uh, illegal convictions. The only way to obtain a conviction under the United States Constitution is without the taint of prosecutorial misconduct, hidden evidence, or any any other such uh, circumstance. I'm going to assume you haven't read 10,000 or so pages from the Innocence Commission case, and you would see that, again, you can let anything please, but there's a lot in there about who got DNA, who knew about DNA, 
uh, what they did or did not do with it. Now, uh, going back to just briefly to the transparency issue, on your flyer, you say about the evidence room, the city of Asheville commissioned an audit of the evidence room after the manager pled guilty. Now, I'm the one that made them do an audit, and based on the audit, I got the SBI and the FBI, and we were able to do prosecution over federal court that had better laws. All right. Now, if you read Rule 3.6, it will tell you that the uh, you have a duty not to have stuff in the press about a pending case. And since I'm part of the person that investigated it, it was our file, then I could feel like I'm bound by that. Uh, again, the innocence condition case I could talk for two hours on. However, we got pending litigation. Uh, the two who uh, uh, were, were uh, turned loose, they uh, had civil litigation. And still some criminal litigation going on, so I'm not allowed to talk about that. The other three whose claims of innocence were rejected. They're now have lawyers, same lawyers, and they're filing post conviction. So, again, I'm frequently hamstrung with what I can say. But go read the 10,000 pages, then come and sit down and talk to me. Mr. Moore, what ethical issues arise, if any, for a district attorney in cooperating with the various law enforcement agencies that would be in one's district? For example, in questioning suspects as opposed to persons not yet charged with a crime, what's the proper ethical boundaries between the district attorney's office and the law enforcement offices? Well, the district attorney's duty by law is to deny his law enforcement, and that's what we've done for years. They, they ask for advice, they call us in the middle of the night, we help them with their search warrants, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, every lawyer sitting in here that practice, uh, practices law on a regular basis, especially the drug cases that brought their clients to our office, and we will have the drug officer there. And I sat, on, sat in on many interviews uh, with them. Uh, the lawyers wanted us to talk to their clients to see if they could help themselves. Uh, law enforcement asked for advice. Sometimes they asked us to be present. Uh, we tried to do that through the years to give them good advice. I want to create a law firm culture in the district attorney's office. I will not see myself as a quote unquote top cop as the district attorney is, is, is sometimes referred to. I want Van Duncan to, to have complete control about interference from my office or the uh, police chief or special agent in charge. They investigate and I am a resource to them. I think it only muddies the cases creates needless conflicts for the district attorney to be too involved closely with law enforcement. So, under my leadership, there will be, there will be a blurring of lines as much as possible. I want to create a law firm environment within the district attorney's office. I will serve as an attorney rather than, uh, I, don't, I don't want there to be any confusion. I will, I will serve as an attorney, as a district attorney. Gentlemen, as a, a final question, and I'll direct it to you first, Mr. Williams. Why should the voters elect you as the district attorney? To justice. I have committed my career to justice in that for 15 years I've served citizens of North Carolina and the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution in providing <coughs> individuals who are brought for for prosecution before these North Carolina courts with competent representation. I have served, I, I have represented thousands of people in this courthouse from district court, to superior court, juvenile court. Uh, I, I served as a public defender liaison and adult drug treatment court for years. I understand how that specialized court is set up. Moreover, I've been able to practice throughout Western North Carolina. And I have the perspective of having created close collaborative relationships with a number of different district, district attorney's offices, law enforcement officers through, from throughout Western North Carolina. I have the experience over 15 years to handle this work, to handle this job. And for that reason, I'm confident and I'm capable and I'm asking for your vote, May 6th. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Boyd, same question. Why should the voters 
elect you uh, to continue as district attorney? For 23 plus years, I stood in this courtroom and handled everything that's come through, all the way from <coughs> cases to capital murder. I prosecuted, as I said earlier, Lord knows how many cases in front of the jury. The first year I was in office, we once tried three murder cases in 12 days. We tried nine or 10, 10 or 11 in the first year, six months I was in office between the first year. We have, the DA is a leader in court, the DA is a leader to the staff. I'm an administrator too. I have 35 people that work for me, give or take one. Uh, you have to have some administrative experience. You have to have some trial experience to lead the DA's office. You have no trial experience for serious cases, never tried a murder case. Uh, Ron Payne, Forrest Farrell, Judge Downs, if you look in the paper, an hour ago, Dennis Winter's letter uh, showed up on the Citizen Times. Those are four judges who have sat in this courtroom days and weeks and hours and watched what my office has done over the last 23 years, watched what my staff has done. They have all endorsed Van Duncan, the sheriff, Jerry Behan is the head of the uh, uh, emergency management, has watched us on the arson task force. Uh, you've seen the letters that have gone out from the Highway Patrol, the officers with 30 years experience, the homicide detectives, the uh, serious felony detectives, the head of the SBI, David Barnes, uh, the guy who succeeded him, Toby uh, Hayes, has sent a letter. Uh, these are the people that know our work, and they know what we do, regardless of any agenda, regardless of any uh, allegations in the paper that are just that, regardless of any allegations and motions, they have watched us work in this courtroom, know the quality of our work, know that we're one of the best run DA's office around, and we have one of the best staffs around, which I'm very proud of. Thank you. Mr. Ron Williams, Tom Williams, gentlemen, thank you for participating.